Welcome back to Operation Freedom, folks. I'm Dr. Dave Janda, broadcasting our ancillary bunker link to Freedom Bunker in the People's Republic of Ann Arbor. Here live for you every Sunday from 2 to 5 Eastern, also available 24-7 with extra shows, content, guest analysis, archives to all of our shows at DaveJanda.com. Stop on by. I am honored to have back with me someone who's a very dear friend and someone who gives incredible insight, insight you will never get from any other platform, and that is Commander Scott Snow. There are... Um, Scott's um, resume is is incredible. He um, was one of the top fighter pilots in our country, possibly our country's history, actually. He's very modest about things. But he he uh, logged over 3,200 fighter hours, 2,025 of which were in the F-14, 618 landings on aircraft carriers, and 335 combat hours. Scott's uh, resume is um, incredibly impressive, and but I'll give you the Reader's Digest version. Uh, is In addition to being one of the top fighter pilots in our country, Scott was in charge of all aviation operations for all carrier groups in the Pacific and oversaw operations for the Top Gun program. It's my honor to welcome back Commander Scott Snow. Scott, welcome back. Thank you, Doctor. Good to be back with you again. So, uh, Scott, uh, I, I want to run, I want to get your take on um, what I call the righteous radicals, um, Harris and um, Waltz. Uh, I've been criticized by a number of people in criticizing Waltz over his fabrication of his um, military career, and I've been criticized over my uh, dissection of Kamala Harris as what few policies she has put forward are actually consistent with more of a communist foundation. And add to that recently, Elon Musk weighed in and publicly agreed, actually, that Kamala Harris is, quote, quite literally a communist, end quote. Scott, you've, you've been, uh, this isn't your first rodeo, obviously, in dealing with politicians or dissecting what politicians' policies are and how it can affect not just our country, but the world. What's your take on what I have called these righteous radicals? Well, it, basically, you're looking at two of the most uh, untoward individuals, and they're trying to make it so distasteful for the American populace that they're going to swap them out at the DNC. It's it's going to be just an, an utter mess and very interesting to watch what happens. As far as stolen val- valor goes, uh, it's it, it hurts my heart for all the the good E9s out there. If you're in that command master sergeant position, you are the leader of that group. And for him to turn tail and run right when they're getting deployed, that's that's just straight up cowardice. For Kamala, Kamala scares me because when she starts throwing out things like price controls, what is price controls? The government's going to control the price on everything? As I explain socialism to people and in turn communism, there are no rich. Everybody is equally poor, and that's where we're headed with this team. And and Scott, the question I have on on Walls uh, because he did abandon his unit when they were called into service to be deployed into uh, Iraq. Uh, Scott, how he he supposedly just retired? Oh, I retire. How was he allowed to do that? Because to me, I would think his actions and how he how he went about doing it would be more consistent, not with a retirement, but a court martial. Am I, where, where, what am I missing here? What well, once he, he accepted that he was going to be frocked and go to school to be an E nine, then he needed to stay the course. So my, much like I, I would put on commander or if I put on Navy captain, you have to do your, your, your time. You, you now you're buying another commitment. So if I stuck around to put on captain, I would have to owe another, it would be three more years in uniform mm-hmm. before you'd be able to carry that rank outside. So 
a, a true act of cowardice, and the, the stolen valor part is, is what really gets every single veteran uh, riled up, because there, there's just no excuse for that. And one of the biggest military goat rodeos, at least in my lifetime, was the botched pullout, if you will, in Afghanistan by the Biden-Harris regime. Uh, Kamala Harris was asked, and there's a videotape of this, uh, well, you know, how close are you to these decisions? And she said when it came, came to the Afghanistan debacle, she didn't call it a debacle, but the, uh, uh, she was the last person in the room with Joe Biden when the decision was made about not only how, not only moving out of Afghanistan, but how we did it. So with that with her own words saying that she was integrally involved in how the Afghanistan withdrawal occurred from a commander in chief standpoint, Scott, if I was in the military, I'd be, I'd be, and I mean this, the words I'm saying, deathly afraid of her. Am I off in that assessment? No, you're a hundred percent correct. The, the, the problem being is you get too many politicians that have, no idea what they're doing, and they they take no responsibility for their actions, and we're the ones that end up bearing the brunt of it. Afghanistan was a complete and utter failure. It was a complete and utter embarrassment for you know the United States that I grew up and in, in defended and fought for in two wars. And what you see is is when you have a, a feckless leader like a Kamala who couldn't even lead you out of a, a paper bag, they make bad decisions. And because they, they do it not based on logic or anything else, they do it based on, well, it's all politics. How is this going to look? What are the optics? That's all they care about. They don't care about right. They don't care about wrong. They just care about preserving their aura of leadership. And in that botched pullout out of Afghanistan, uh, Scott, it led to the preventable deaths of 13 U.S. service members, left th- several thousand Americans stranded behind enemy lines, and allowed, I think it was $80 billion in U.S. military equipment. And there was the Taliban just had a three year anniversary parade where they paraded. All the equipment we left behind in this enormous parade. I mean, did, uh, Scott, if it boiled my blood, it must have boiled your blood having served over there. Oh, absolutely. Well, all, all the, the time, money, blood, and treasure that we spent over there, countless friends, lives lost, and all for what? Just to give all give it all away? It, it, at least the Taliban had the, uh, the wherewithal to, to paint you know, white wall tires on the uh, on the truck, so they didn't look like they rolled right off of our assembly lines and into their hands. But a, a complete and utter embarrassment. And, and and Scott, now let's turn to the Russia Ukraine situation. Give us your assessment because now you have these uh, globalist shills out there saying, "Well, look at Ukraine making these great gains into Kursk, and this is a turning point of the war, and it's going to go, it, it, it's going to go Ukraine's way." And we have acknowledgement through the Pentagon that the, the Kursk invasion into Russia from the from Ukraine was uh, utilized U.S. weapons and not just U.S. technology, but it appears. U.S. personnel guiding these operations. Uh, you know, Scott, uh, you're the military expert. I'm not. But to me, it looks like they're sucking these guys in, into, into Russia, and they're going to close the back door on these guys. And these guys are essentially, these Ukrainians are in a shooting gallery that they've been sucked into. Is that a false assessment on my part? No, you're you're spot on what, what, what's going to happen is that they're they're all going to get smoked this is the uh, the desperate acts of a dying regime so these guys have been losing the war greatly as uh, overinflated by our u.s media saying oh Zelensky's great everyone's winning look we're winning 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 no they've been losing 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 so they resort to terrorist tactics when they're losing 
So they, they are trying to get that, that last little go. And what they do is they don't go against military targets. They go against the soft underbelly. They go against civilian targets to make the biggest splash they can because they can't fight and they can't win on a military uh, peer to military peer battle. They, they've already lost that. And my gut is telling me that Zelensky is, is soon to be ousted. And I think that will probably happen in the next six to eight weeks. And, and, and Scott, uh, what do you, how do you foresee Putin and his military command uh, handling this issue into Kurtz? I would tell, t- t- because right now, there are folks out there saying, oh, yeah, and Ukraine also has the F-16s, and they're going to use that for support and all that. I mean, Scott, you, you've you said it. The, 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 these F-16s that were sent over there with the folks flying them are absolutely no match for what they're up against from the Russian side of the equation. Educate us on what you think, how how, how, how it's going to play out in Kursk and this whole issue about, wow, they got this great firepower because Ukraine has these F-16s now. Well, in, in Kursk, they're, they're going to get stomped out. And in, in that they're going to be made an example of, and I I know that uh, you know, Putin is is not going to hold back on that. It, it, he is he has been a very patient and strategic leader, but now they have pushed that little bridge too far. You can look at it from the deep state standpoint as they will stop at nothing to get their war. They 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 want to get NATO drug into this, and Putin is the only one not striking back that's preventing that from happening. So now, Scott, folks, we're speaking with Commander Scott Snow. Let's turn to the Middle East. Play out what you think is going to happen there, because many people are saying right now, oh, uh, Iran back down. Iran's not going to do anything. Iran has shot a couple of missiles from Lebanon through their proxies in Lebanon into into Israel. And that's it. It's all it's all it's all settling down. Do you believe that's the case, Scott? No, they're just being patient. If you think about it from a psychological perspective, think of all the the Israeli citizens that are, are just on pins and needles because they mm-hmm. don't know what's coming next and they don't know when it's coming. So they spend every single day, I, am I going to go play soccer and get blown up? Are the missiles flying tonight? Are they flying tomorrow? And the entire time, they're, they're in paralysis mode. So their economy is tanking. The, the, the people are, you know, that their, their government, much like our government, has detached itself from the will of the people. So you, you now have a government, a rogue government running, much like our rogue government is running. And you know, drawing ire and soon-to-be fire from all sides, from Lebanon. They're going to get it from Iran. They're going to get it from Yemen. They're getting it from all sides because they, they have stirred up the hornet's nest. And I, they're surrounded already. And it's just, it's a, it's a matter of time. And I think the only thing holding Iran back right now is, is Putin back channeling to them and, and, and keeping them on a, on a short leash. Scott, many people are saying, well, it's because the U.S. is sending over a, another carrier group and they're sending over uh, a, a nuclear based submarines that have uh, uh, cruise missiles uh, 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 in their ordnance that they can fire. That's not holding it back anything, is it? No, not at all. It, it, it's one where what you're going to see, I, Iran is not going to, to, to mount up and drive all the way across Iraq to get to Israel. They're going to use standoff weapons, which they have a lot of, and Hezbollah has a lot of standoff weapons. It's all going to be missile strikes and precision-guided missile strikes. They're, they're not going to you know, invade like an army would. So it's one where warfare has changed so drastically that it's we, we've already gotten beyond carrier battle groups. We, we've gotten into more strategic and standoff missiles that are precision guided. And that's that's a force to be reckoned with. And it doesn't take a lot to push a button. It takes a lot to man, equip, train and deploy a carrier battle group. That's a lot of moving parts and pieces. That's why we're the only ones in the world that do it well. But it's a lot easier. You can just go push the button. There goes the missile. There's the coordinates. Game over. 
And speaking to that, Scott, over the past several weeks, there have been documented military transport cargo planes bringing in ordnance or, or uh, equipment from Russia into Tehran by the boatload, correct? Yep. And what are they? What do you believe they're bringing in? What are they? What are they sending? What is Putin sending in care packages from Moscow and other related military installations throughout Russia to to Iran? Uh, strategic missiles, and specifically uh, uh, surface-to-air missiles, the S-400 systems, to protect them from the air. The uh, the one thing that Israel would love nothing more to do than to go in and attack the nuclear sites in Iran. This is what's going to keep them from doing that. Let's turn to the third theater of operation, China-Taiwan. Folks are saying, I'm not hearing anything out of China-Taiwan, so that's over with. But, Scott, tell me if I'm off. You've always told me that one of the – there's two windows of opportunity based on weather Uh as it relates to China moving into Taiwan, one of which – is from mid-September to mid-October. So, Scott, is am I remembering that correctly, number one? And number two, is that window going to open this year? I, I can guarantee that window is going to open this year because it's just there's, there's going to be so much chaos in the world. I'd be surprised if it, it, if it doesn't. What you'll see is the feckless leadership of the U.S. right now, as we roll into election season, they're going to do anything and everything to hang on to power. And and it it would not be a far stretch for them to declare martial law, shut the election down, because they know they can't win. If you you even look at at what they're doing now, where they're they're throwing in fake AI-generated crowds for Kamala and and (laughs) Waltz. That right. is absolutely ridiculous, and, and the American public is not buying it anymore. So, Scott, what will we see from a military aspect out of China when we know they're going into Taiwan? You, you'll, you'll see they will move all the, uh, all the airplanes farther forward. They have hundreds upon hundreds of drones, as in old uh, F-6 and F-7 fighter jets that each one of which will require a missile. And when you get into the hundreds and you need two missiles per drone to take it down, they're, they're basically doing the same thing that Iran will do with the Iron Dome, where Iran throws up $2 million worth of drones and the Iron Dome spends a billion dollars in missiles trying to shoot all those down. We're going to mm-hmm. do the exact same thing. And it's what you, you'll see a, a, a very large uh, mass going on you'll see a fifth column stand up in Taiwan because they're already there. And then the ships are going to start coming across. How long will it take for China to take Taiwan when it starts? Three weeks. The ramifications when China takes Taiwan. Uh, The, the chip industry as we know it and technology throughout the Western world will uh, grind to a halt. Because now all the advanced chips that come out of Taiwan are under Chinese control. And that will dominate the high-tech battle space for years to come. And there are many people that believe that uh, the United States will step in and have the firepower to be able to save the day for Taiwan. Is that true, Scott? No. The, The problem being it's such a logistical nightmare. To, to be able to defend you know, this island that is 100 miles off of China, and we're going 1,500 miles is our closest, where uh, Kadena is, to get there from a land base, and we try to do everything else sea-based. It, logistically, it's, it's, it's a near impossible feat. When we did Iraq and we had six carrier battle groups out there, you would be absolutely amazed at how much airborne gas there was just to make that happen, and that was without any opposition. Now you have an opposing force and you're going to try to put tankers in the air. That's the first thing it's going to go. You, you cut the logistics off and I can only do so much with a fully fueled F-18. You need a tanker. You need the carrier. You need defense in depth to make all this stuff work. 
in the amount of fuel and the amount of logistics that it takes to make this happen is, is nearly insurmountable. And of the three theaters, Scott, uh, Russia, Ukraine, uh, the Middle East, and uh, China, Taiwan, which one keeps you up at night? I mean, I know they all three do, but of the three, which is the one that's most concerning to you? Uh, Israel, because they're, they're, they're off the leash and, and they're not going to stop. And that, that to me, it, it's a, as we've spoken about in the past, the Middle East is always a tinderbox. There's always a fire burning there. But the, the nuclear genie is going to come out of the bottle and then it's all, all bets are off. I, I don't see China, Taiwan going nuclear unless we try to go in and circumvent our logistics failures by going nuclear ourselves. But then that becomes, you know, it, the end of the globe as we know it. I, I see <clears throat> Russia, Ukraine, I think Putin has is, is worn out his, uh, his patience. And this, this last foray into Russian territory and attacking Russian citizens uh, won't, won't stand, won't, won't go unchallenged. So I think he's going to speed things up in Ukraine and and just push to the finish line. So the primary concern is the Middle East. Correct. So if, if you were, um, if things were different in our last two minutes, Scott, if things were different and you were uh, had access to the Oval Office, what would you do to try to circumvent the potential of a beyond a regional nuclear event. What would you do? What would you suggest? Uh, that, you, first of all, you got to you got to cut the uh, cut the supply lines off. You need to stop funding Israel. Stop sending them weapons, man, material, and equipment. And that's that's where you have to cut it off. You got to stop the bombs from going over there. And at that point, you you sit them down. And you actually get all the leaders in the room. You get G, you get Putin, you get Netanyahu, and our president, and we work it out. Because it is one where, unless they get Israel under control, the, the Middle East is going to go up. And it's going to be 4,500 degrees and partly cloudy. 